Today we're joined by a very interesting panel. They're from Crimea. They're Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians who are concerned about the Russian occupation. I'm Mihal O'Hurley, and you're watching In Conversation This Week. Our first guest is Isla Bacali. She's the Crimean Tatar representative at the United Nations. Welcome back to the program, Isla. Thank you for having me, Michael. It's nice to be back again. And we also have on our program today, Denis Sevchenko of Crimea SOS. Denis, welcome. Uh, hello, Michael. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. And from the registered charity Q-Hub, we have two young Crimean Tatars, Emil Ibrahim and Zoria Mustafaeva, to tell us about their work and their experiences. Thank you for inviting me. I'm appreciating being given this opportunity. All this and more on In Conversation this week. You are watching In Conversation This Week with Michal O'Hurley. First, let's talk to Isla Bacali. Isla, it's been about six months since you've been on the program. How are you holding up in New York during this pandemic? Of course, it's been trying, but gradually as the um, uh, individuals get vaccinated and with our vaccination cards, we have been having a um, opportunities to attend some conferences and some sessions. But overall, uh, it has been difficult. Um, it has been a difficult and trying time in order to communicate our issues in a more expansive audience. But we're moving forward despite the challenges. Ayla, tell me if you will about your work with the UN. Are you able to meet in public these days or are most of the meetings still virtual? They are remote. I have attended um, quite a few me meetings and they have been all remote. Isla, the pandemic couldn't have come at a worse time from the South China Sea to the Russian occupations of Transnistria, Georgia and Crimea to famine and conflict in the Horn of Africa. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa seems to be on fire with conflicts. Tell me, what do you think the UN's appetite is to do something about the Russian occupation of Crimea, Donbass, and other areas of conflict? And what do you expect them to do in the near future? Well, that's an excellent question. Thank you uh, for that, Michael. Um, I like to just jump in uh, on the recent situation, what's happening on, on the ground in occupied Crimea. Of recent, uh, we are witnessing an uptick in a high number of arrests, detainees with a new twist of tactics that is being employed. Uh, by the Russian occupiers in that, that they are now beginning to arrest the bystanders who are uh, there as good Samaritan neighbors supporting the detainees and they show up to give them moral support and nothing else. And we saw this uptick immediately upon the arrest of the first deputy majlis leader, Neriman Jelal, and four other Crimean Tatar youth, young men, who were searched, detained by Russian security forces, accusing them of alleged sabotage of a gas pipeline uh, near the vicinity of Simferopol. Uh, this, uh, the accusation uh, comes on, the arrest comes on September 3rd and Fourth, those are the date lines. And this is a, quite a coincidence that the arrest uh, was made after Neriman Jalal attended the Crimean platform, which was held in Kiev on August 23rd. So uh, the bystanders who were there numbered 
approximately 50 to 55 persons, and they were all charged with administrative fees. Uh, that, that, that's a hefty sum. It's about 70 to 100, uh, $100. So the uh, inability uh, for uh, association is being uh, suppressed as well. And uh, this alarmed uh, the Crimean Tatar community, it, uh, it alarmed Kiev, it alarmed uh, Ukrainian human rights uh, defenders, it alarmed everyone. The Crimean Tatars have certainly suffered the brunt of persecution on the peninsula of Crimea since the 2014 Russian occupation and attempted annexation. Um, what other organizations have become involved in addressing the plight and the troubles faced by the Crimean Tatars? On the heels of this uh, roundup of uh, innocent people, um, the Ukrainian uh, human rights uh, delegation came uh, to the United States, to the United Nations, and also made a visit in Washington, D.C. And the groups were the human uh, the Crimean Human Rights Group, Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union, the Ukrainian Institute, and Zimna, the Human Rights Center in Kiev, yeah. and the wife of the journalist of Radio Liberty, um, uh, Vladislav Yespenko, and uh, they all um, uh, shared their stories and the, uh, the direct situation when the news was quite hot and alive and active. So they briefed uh, the uh, UN uh, member nations on the situation. Isla, we're all aware of Resolution 262 at the UN, which recognized Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. What has the UN done to follow up since then? It has adopted uh, numerous uh, resolutions in 2014 um, and also in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. And if I may cite um, 71 slash 205, 72 slash 190, 73 slash 263, 74 uh, slash 168 and 75, 192. And moreover, there are multiple resolutions on the problem of militarization of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol, which includes parts of the Black Sea and the Sea of uh, Azov. And what is so important, so critical about these resolutions are not only are they instrumental, but they also serve as instruments in providing the exact legal language in political and legal terms. This is critical to uh, communicate exactly what Russia is doing on the ground. Ayla, I know President Biden will be holding a democracy summit online later this week. Uh, will Crimea and the Russian occupation figure into that? And do you expect anything to come of it? Um, United States uh, still holds the key for democracy. Uh, I'm here in New York. I have been in DC numerous times and I've seen the democracy at work despite some of the um, uh, challenges, some of the rhetoric and, and some of the um, harsh words that are going back and forth. But democracy is messy. It's messy and the key part is that both Americans and Ukrainians have uh, loved their freedom and Ukraine has been seeking their freedom since um, uh, 1917 and 1918. It has been, its nemesis has been Russia throughout those years. But uh, Ukraine is struggling to forge its independent path. U.S. in the ensuing uh, Soviet years in the early part uh, in in the early part of the 20th century demonstrated extraordinary resolve in defending democracy and security of its allies, and uh, also uh, West Berlin and West Germany from Soviet aggression. Today, more than ever, 
Ukraine needs that same support from US. And especially, especially after the return to power of the Taliban in Afghanistan, there will be a little hope <laughs> uh, for freedom in the world if Ukraine, uh, if Biden fails this summit. And it will be another booster shot for the Kremlin and along with other um, uh, autocratic uh, uh, nations from Belarus all the way across the Pacific. And Ukraine has evidence. It has its political uh, prisoners in, the, in Crimea, in occupied Crimea, there are close, we are getting incrementally close to 15,000 Ukrainian soldiers dying. And they are also comprised of volunteers. And um, uh, these are evidence and outright actions of the good people of Ukraine and its diverse people, which includes Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians who, uh, who are going all the way. They, their heels are dug in deep and uh, they tasted freedom. And once you taste freedom, you never go back. And I think uh, Russia needs to understand that and it does not understand it yet. Before we talk about Crimea, we need to talk about both Ukraine and Crimea to dispel some of the hybrid warfare information propaganda, if you will, that comes out of Russia on a continuing basis. First, Ukraine has been a European nation for over a thousand years. In the Middle Ages, when the King of France needed a wife, he turned to the nobility of Ukraine. Yaroslav the Wise's daughter married the King of France, and at the time she was the only literate person in the entire French court. That is the ancient history of Ukraine and her people. As for Crimea, Russia's involvement in Crimea is really relatively recent. It started under Catherine the Great, it was bolstered under the Tsars, and during Soviet times, Crimean Tatars especially knew nothing but the cruel hand of Soviet oppression. For the last 30 years, Crimea, an integral part of Ukraine, has enjoyed the protection of Ukrainian citizenship albeit as an autonomous republic. The Crimean Tatars were able to return from expulsion to Siberia and the Russian interior and start their lives again as the indigenous people of Crimea. So we're gonna watch a little explainer video that helps us understand better before we talk to our panel. The Autonomous Republic of Crimea is the southernmost region of Ukraine, Europe's largest country. It stretches across the Crimean Peninsula, surrounded by the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. Located at the crossroads of civilizations, Crimea was colonized by the Greeks and the Romans, by Gothic tribes, Kievan Rus, and the Byzantine Empire. The Golden Horde also incorporated Crimea within its territories. In the mid-14th century, Crimea's melting pot of cultures gave birth to its own native people, the Crimean Tatars. <laughs> This ethnic entity was formed in the era of the Crimean Khanate. Influenced by Islamic culture, it blended its Turkic roots with those of the early mountainous Crimean inhabitants. The Crimean Khanate was a sovereign state with its own free hand in international relations, but often under the protection of the Ottoman Empire. During the 16 and 1700s, the Crimean Tatars often raided the neighboring Ukrainian lands, where Ukrainian Cossacks successfully stood up to them. Over time, hostility changed to military alliances against greater military powers. In 1648, the Ukrainian Cossack leader Bohdan Khmelnytsky allied his army with the Crimean Khanate to liberate Ukraine from Poland. Fearing the rise of the Ukrainian Cossack state, Crimean Tatars withdrew their support and sided with Poland. This was one of the reasons that forced Khmelnytsky to seek support from Moscow in 1654. In the late 1700s, Russia signed a friendship alliance with the Crimean Khanate, recognizing its independence. But in 1783, Russia broke its promises and eliminated the Crimean Khanate, annexing Crimea. In the 19th century, Crimea, and especially its port city of Sevastopol, gained strategic importance for the expansionist Russian Empire. Crimean Tatars, native to the peninsula, were seen as an obstacle for Russia's imperial ambitions and were suppressed culturally and economically. Many were forced to emigrate after the Crimean War in the 1850s. 
After the collapse of the Russian Empire in 1917, the Crimean Tatars instituted their own national governing assembly, the Kuroltai, and established the Crimean People's Republic, the first Turkic and Muslim democratic republic in the world. At the same time, Bolsheviks launched a military offensive in Crimea. Sevastopol was captured in early 1918, and by the end of 1920, Bolsheviks controlled the rest of the peninsula. After Crimea became an autonomous republic within the Russian Federation in 1921, Bolshevik terror engulfed the peninsula. Over 100,000 of its residents, most of whom were Crimean Tatars, perished in famine. In the 1930s, Russification was enforced on the peninsula, and persecution of Crimean Tatars intensified. The Crimean Peninsula was the scene of some of the bloodiest battles of World War II. After it was liberated from the Nazis, Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin ordered mass deportation of Crimean Tatar. Between May 18 and May 20, 1944, hundreds of thousands of Crimean Tatars were put into cattle trains and moved several thousand kilometers away to Uzbekistan and other Soviet republics. Tens of thousands died during deportation. To rebuild Crimea's war-torn economy, in 1954 the Soviet government decided to transfer Crimea's administrative jurisdiction to Soviet Ukraine. Ukraine's natural resources and infrastructure revived Crimea. In 1991, Crimea became an autonomy within Ukraine. Crimean Tatars were returning home. In 2013, Ukraine's pro-Russian president Yanukovych refused to sign the EU association agreement. While pro-Western protests were breaking out in Kiev, Russia began executing its long-planned operation to annex Crimea. In February 2014, Russia instigated protests in Sevastopol, claiming Crimea's desire to be a part of Russia. Crimean Tatars tried to prevent Russian hysteria in the Crimean parliament, but it was too late. On February 27, 2014, masked Russian troops without military insignia seized the Crimean parliament. Other strategic sites across Crimea were quickly occupied, and a Russian puppet government took over. Within less than three weeks, an illegal referendum on the status of Crimea was held on the peninsula. In March 2014, Russia formally incorporated Crimea as its federal subject. Crimea has become Russia's militarized zone, a peninsula of fear where human rights of Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians are systematically violated. Over 100 Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians have become political prisoners in Russia. Many have disappeared. Now we're going to go to Denis Savchenko, the young lawyer with Crimea SOS. Denis, I know Crimea SOS is intimately involved with daily life in Crimea. What is life like under the cruel Russian occupation? Uh, thank you for the question. It's uh, quite complicated, uh, Michael. Uh, well, uh, Crimea definitely suffers from systematic violations of human rights, and we see degradation of uh, um, situation in very different spheres. We talk about um, ecology, we talk about culture, we talk about education, we talk about access to basic uh, social and uh, administrative rights. Uh, we talk about damaging the identity of uh, residents of Crimea. Uh, Russia doesn't want uh, uh, doesn't want inhabitants of occupied territories to be diverse. Uh, Russia wants to see, uh, uh, you know, this gray mass of people uh, who, um, who never want to, who never want to have some special opinion on what is happening, who only uh, wants to uh, conform and wants to follow the general policy which is established by the Kremlin. So uh, in general, the situation in Crimea is very bad. Dennis, when I speak to the Russians, they always tell me that what happened in 2014 with the Russian occupation and attempted annexation was nothing more than Russians on Crimea desiring to rejoin the Russian Federation what had previously been the Soviet Union. Is that true? And if it's true, how do you account for the need to militarize the island 
to keep it under Russian control, such as only this week a new paratroop regiment being stationed on Crimea. Uh, firstly, uh, Michael, I would like to mention that the majority of uh, population anywhere is uh, thinking of a very material issues and does not have or uh, does not want to uh, express their uh, uh, social political um, uh, opinion on different uh, things. And uh, in, in, in case of occupation of Crimea, uh, this uh, played uh, very well for uh, Russian Federation because uh, they uh, have been using uh, propaganda and different other instruments of uh, uh, hybrid war against Ukraine for a very long time, and they definitely uh, were influencing the um, minds and, uh, you know, the social opinion, the public opinion in Crimea for a very long time. And so when the uh, troops and when the uh, process of a military operation started, it was quite easy for uh, Kremlin to show uh, some image, uh, absolutely artificial image, of, um, uh, of residents, of inhabitants of Crimean Peninsula um, willing to join Russian Federation. But in practice, uh, uh, the uh, number of people uh, uh, actively, actively sympathizing uh, Russian Federation was not uh, very high, despite uh, I agree that there were inhabitants of uh, Crimea, of, Pe of Peninsula, uh, who wanted uh, Russian Federation to uh, grab uh, Peninsula, especially we talk about the uh, representatives of uh, Black Sea Fleet, who were actually Russian Federation citizens at the moment or uh, as of the uh, occupation. So uh, this is a very big problem. And the second uh, problem is that um, Ukraine, Ukrainian government was in a very difficult situation after the revolution of dignity, after these political changes, and um, uh, Ukrainian government was uh, very vulnerable, and so uh, Russian Federation used uh, uh, a perfect moment to strike, to, um, to implement this uh, operation, and to just to occupy the part of Ukraine, and this is uh, includingly this is why they were so successful. But still, without uh, troops, uh, I don't think that this could happen. And uh, following your question to Isla, is uh, annexation was lawful? No, it wasn't annexation. It wasn't lawful. Uh, it was illegal. Uh, um, primarily because of the fact of a very high number of troops and uh, military technique present uh, on the territory of Crimea starting from the end of February and following all the time of occupation in 2015. Dennis, when I think back to the Russian occupation of Georgia some 13 years or more ago, I recognize that Russian passportization, that is issuing passports to Georgians to craft them to identify as Russians, and then forcing them to carry Russian passports after the occupation as a way of alienating them from their country has had a powerful effect. Can the Crimean people continue to identify as Crimeans, as Ukrainians, when they're forced to carry Russian passports? Has passportization happened in Crimea and what effect is it having? Yes, definitely. This is the same situation that happened, and this is the same tactic that Russian Federation used in Crimea, primarily um, uh, occupational authorities and uh, Kremlin directly. They vote that Ukrainians, that Kiremli, Crimean Tatars, that uh, citizens of Russia, they will be on a, a very... Um, um, on a similar ground and they will have the similar uh, amount of rights uh, and duties on the, in, in Crimea and they vote that uh, Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar languages will be official in line with Russian language. But in practice, uh, Russian Federation has never planned to uh, provide uh, Ukrainian citizens with the same amount of rights and 
passport um, uh, um, enforced provision of passports and enforced uh, inclusion into the citizenship of Russian Federation was a very important uh, step for them to uh, to get a control over the situation and to start this uh, systematic uh, persecution and uh, uh, put in uh, uh, those who did not agree with occupation under an immense uh, pressure, including using uh, criminal and administrating administrative persecution. Worth mentioning that um, to obtain a passport of uh, a citizen of Russian Federation was very easy. They were disseminated almost automatically among um, people who permanently were um, uh, residing on the territory of peninsula as of uh, March 2014. But to, um, to cancel uh, this process, uh, to uh, refuse to obtain a uh, Russian Federation passport was extremely hard. There were only uh, two departments of uh, Federal Migration Service established who, um, who acquired, who uh, were allowed to receive um, applications uh, for cancellation of uh, uh, Russian Federation citizenship. And the procedure was uh, absolutely not understandable to um, residents of Crimea. And the time frame was very small. So people even knowing about how to uh, cancel this process, how to avoid uh, becoming citizens of Russian Federation, often they did not have uh, a chance to uh, use this in practice just because of how difficult it was. So um, using uh, Russian Federation passports was a very important instrument and still is very important instrument of uh, influence and pressure for Russian Federation. So as in other operations, because we see that Russian Federation use, uses the same uh, techniques and tactics they were using from the Soviet times when they were occupying other territories. We only need to watch a Vladimir Putin press conference on Ukraine or Crimea or hear Foreign Minister Lavrov speak to hear them assert repeatedly that the resistance to Russification or refusing to accept a Russian passport on occupied Crimea or in Donbass are terrorist acts in and of themselves. Are the Crimean Tatars terrorists? Or are they simply an indigenous people in their autonomous republic, which is part of Ukraine, trying to hold on to their identity and assert their rights? And is Russia using terrorism as a blunt card and instrument to round up those who resist the occupation? Yes, but that's not all. Uh, first of all, uh, using uh, uh, demonization of Crimean Tatars is uh, uh, is a technique that Russian Federation started using far earlier than the occupation of Crimea started. Uh, um, Crimean Tatars were uh, demonized uh, in the times of uh, uh, Joseph Stalin. Uh, they were accused of being collaborants in the Second World War, despite they were very actively involved in uh, defense uh, in defending the homeland, the motherland uh, at that time, um, and uh, using uh, anti-terroristic and anti-extremist um, uh, legislation is uh, just shows how unfair the policy of Russian Federation against Crimean Tatars is. And uh, I, I think that Kremlin uh, historically uh, fears uh, Crimean Tatars because they were historically against uh, a presence of Russian uh, Federation or Russia in its different uh, forms, the Soviet Union, the Russian Empire, and now the Russian Federation. So they were, as an indigenous uh, people of Crimea, uh, they were always against uh, the presence of uh, violent occupiers in their land. And this is why they uh, suffer now. And using uh, the terroristic, um, uh, terroristic uh, this mark of terrorists against uh, Crimean Tatars, it also plays a very important role in uh, propaganda and in um, 
uh, in bringing this uh, this uh, policy of fear and terror on the occupied territories. So, um, in other words, uh, Russian Federation uses uh, this uh, demonizing of Crimean Tatars and making them a, a, an enemies, some violent, uh, some violent group of um, residents of Crimea to keep the control over other categories of population in Crimea, showing them that, look, we came, we, we, we brought Crimea back to Russia and now we protect you from those uh, Muslims, from those Crimean Tatars and so on. But all of this is just part of propaganda and has uh, absolutely uh, nothing close to the truth. And we can prove it by looking at these uh, so-called Hizbut Tahrir criminal cases that are very unfair and uh, that in their essence violate even uh, the um, Russian Federation criminal procedural uh, legislation, not talking about the international uh, standards of criminal persecution in general. Dennis, I know you don't practice as a lawyer, even though you were trained as one. But from your work with Crimea SOS, have you been able to document that when Crimean Tatars are arrested, that they're transported to Russia, deprived of their fundamental rights to due process of law and effective counsel, and the ability to mount an effective, if not successful, defense? Are their rights being upheld? The process of uh, detaining uh, Crimean Tatars is full of violations. Um, the attorneys are not allowed to be present during the searches and during the uh, initial primarily uh, detention. The, uh, uh, the, there, is, the, there is a group of uh, attorneys, uh, including Crimean Tatars and eth ethnical um, um, uh, Russians that uh, starting from 2014 systematically working with uh, uh, with victims of um, human rights violations and they are being um, they are being persecuted themselves including um, um, uh, Mr. Smidlaev the uh, Crimean Tata attorney who was arrested recently was arrested just uh, uh, for trying to um, to, uh, to, to, to work to implement his responsibilities uh, before his uh, clients, the uh, Crimean Tatars who were detained uh, and administratively punished just for supporting uh, their, uh, their uh, like close ones and representatives of their community. So, um, uh, so the problem is that uh, Russian Federation uses illegal instruments of influence against uh, uh, those uh, detained and persecuted. We talk about uh, illegal searches, we talk about inhuman conditions, we talk about tortures, uh, we talk about uh, violations of the rights uh, within the criminal process. For example, uh, Crimean Tatars, they are not allowed to talk uh, in Crimean Tatar language during court hearings, despite Crimean Tatar language is an official language according to the constitution of the Republic of Crimea that was adopted by the Russian Federation. So they contradict themselves. And so the, 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 the amount of uh, violations is just uh, mm -hmm. unbelievably, un unbelievably high. Uh, so yes, of course we can say that uh, a person who, uh, uh, who appeared uh, a person of interest for uh, Russian Federation uh, law enforcement and security uh, service uh, author authorities, they become victims um, of many, many uh, crimes. Dennis, I want to talk about human rights and the rule of law. We continue to read reports from the United Nations, uh, from the European Union and observer bodies that Ukrainians, that Crimeans, and Crimean Tatars have been forced from their homes, beaten, summarily arrested and detained without adequate charges and access to legal counsel, that they have been tortured in detention, and even summary executions have occurred. Have these things happened? 
yes, unfortunately, our organization and our partner organizations um, identified and documented uh, several uh, cases of inhuman uh, um, of inhuman behavior or uh, tortures against uh, those who uh, were in custody or detained or uh, being uh, imprisoned in Crimea and then either uh, transferred to the uh, Russian Federation to Rostov on Don or maybe even further uh, to Sibir, uh, Siberia. Um, we uh, documented uh, different uh, cases of uh, inhuman treatment of Crimean Tatars in, uh, in particular when they were uh, when they were banned from uh, executing uh, the religious rituals, when they were banned from uh, reading or even having a uh, Quran in their uh, uh, prison cell, when they were provide, when they've been provided with uh, a food including the uh, uh, pig meat, which is uh, uh, which is prohibited for them, so they had to be starving. They had to. Uh, refuse from eating at all. Uh, we uh, we uh, we documented the cases when the administration of prisons or uh, or isolation uh, uh, centers they uh, they were very harsh against uh, Crimean Tatars, and that we just we just identified that uh, the treatment of other um, uh, imprisoned persons and Crimean Tatars is very different and not in favor of uh, of the latter category of uh, um, of imprisoned persons. So that is uh, uh, a very uh, common practice uh, for the occupational authorities and uh, for Russian Federation. And we always have to link uh, what the occupational authorities is are doing and what uh, uh, the Kremlin is uh, want want them to do because uh, in many cases uh, we have uh, a decision by the Supreme Court of Russian Federation confirming that there are no violations in cases when um, when the uh, human rights violations were inflicted upon um, upon uh, uh, people in a temporary occupied Crimea. So this shows that the general policy that the general uh, behavior of Kremlin is totally in line with what is happening uh, in uh, temporarily occupied Crimea starting from 2013. Dennis, I'd like to be unequivocally clear on this point. Has Crimea SOS been able to document that Crimean Tatars or ethnic Ukrainians on Crimea have been summarily executed or disappeared under the Russian occupation since 2014. Yes, at least the case of Rishat Ametov confirms it. 44 persons starting from uh, 2014 and 15 of them, the whereabouts and the condition of them is uh, still unknown. Dennis, I'd like to know a little bit more about your work. What is Crimea SOS doing uh, to alleviate the suffering on Crimea? And are you cooperating with the Ukrainian government as part of the Crimean platform uh, to bring about a peaceful resolution of the occupation? Organization started working with occupation of Crimea uh, from the position of reaction to what was happening, providing the direct assistance, uh, including with the focus on uh, legal assistance. But as of now, our organization provides a systematical assistance and try to change systematically uh, what is happening both on the territory of peninsula and on the territory of mainland of Ukraine in relation to the occupation of Crimea and enforced uh, and uh, uh, internal uh, displacement. Uh, we try to uh, maintain the connection between residents of peninsula and um, and uh, the Ukrainian society. And we try to support Ukrainian government in its efforts to uh, change the situation and bring uh, the 
the occupation, the moment of the occupation of Crimea as close as uh, it can happen. And of course, the uh, diplomatical and political uh, approach to the occupation of Crimea is very important and a Crimean platform as an initiative is a very important tool, became a very important tool uh, to uh, reach uh, the goals that we consider as very important and that the government of Ukraine is considered as important. Our organization has been talking about some kind of a entity uh, close to Crimean platform starting from, um, I think, 2015. We totally support uh, the effort of Ukrainian government to establish and to uh, initiate uh, the Crimean platform. And our organization is uh, closely involved in uh, functioning of the expert network of the Crimean uh, platform in different directions, including the ecology, human rights, and uh, many others. Dennis, the other night I watched a documentary from 1940 and a young French girl was asked by a reporter if she could imagine a day when the Nazi occupation of France would come to an end. She said yes, and that day did come. Can you see a day when the Russian occupation of Crimea ends, the autonomous republic is restored as part of Ukraine, and the Crimean Tatars and ethnic Ukrainians uh, have a chance to exercise the freedom that they've known for the last 30 years. Will that day come? I definitely see Crimea as uh, an integral part of Ukrainian society. I see uh, the uh, a rule of law being uh, spread across the peninsula. Uh, and I definitely uh, see uh, Crimea, especially uh, residents of Crimea, including Kiran Lee, inclu including Crimean Tatars as indigenous uh, people being provided with an opportunity to decide how they would like to uh, continue uh, living within Ukraine and being part of Ukraine on, on which basis. Denis Sevchenko with Crimea SOS. I'm sure we'll have you back. You've been a wealth of information. Take care and keep up the good work. Thank you. And now we're going to talk to Emil and Zoria, two young Crimean Tatars, extraordinary young people who are doing great things to assist the Crimean Tatars who are having to live under the Russian occupation. Emil, tell me about your work with QHub. What's your mission and what are your activities? Uh, QHub is an educational uh, platform and nonprofit organization. Uh, which uh, working for unite uh, uh, internal displaced persons from uh, Crimea uh, in, uh, in in mainland uh, of Ukraine and uh, for unite also uh, Crimean youth which live in Crimea now uh, through uh, educational uh, cultural media projects uh, another another social projects and uh, it's a um, um, youth organization, I can say, um, in, which, uh, in which all uh, Crimea youth and also Ukrainian youth uh, can help each other to uh, develop, uh, to, uh, to do uh, good, important projects for uh, Ukrainians, for Crimeans, for Crimea. Uh, at first. Emil, how many internally displaced Crimean Tatars are there uh, living in Ukraine because of the Russian occupation? As I know, in Ukraine now uh, we have uh, among uh, 30,000 uh, uh, internal displaced persons, which live in uh, Kiev as uh, capital of Ukraine uh, in the Kherson region, in the Lviv region, uh, Odessa also, um, a little bit in uh, the Dnipro region, Dnipropetrovsk region, and uh, Kharkiv region also. Emil, one of the real dangers of the world allowing the occupation of Crimea or any land to continue is that eventually the people lose or are deprived of their identity. 
Are your memories of your indigenous homeland on Crimea strong enough? Are your cultural bonds strong enough? And are you and your generation strong enough to endure until the occupation ends that so you can identify again as Crimean Tatars and part of the Ukrainian family? Thank you for the question. So uh, when uh... Uh, when, it, when it was uh, 2014, uh, I was I, I studied in uh, Kharkiv, uh, not in Crimea, uh, and but my um, but I wished uh, to return to Crimea after uh, finish my uh, university, but I understood that it's uh, impossible uh, because uh, Crimea now is is uh, is. Uh, so both was uh, occupation uh, occupied by Russian Federation. Uh, my uh, family and my friends, uh, which uh, younger uh, now uh, are uh, in a very difficult situation because uh, they uh, trying uh, to choose uh, between Russian and Ukrainian realities mm, because. Uh, from one side, uh, they will uh, they they want uh, uh, stay in Crimea because uh, it's uh, our uh, homeland, and uh, we know that Crimean others uh, have a very uh, difficult uh, history uh, and uh, fight, uh, fighting fighting uh, uh, for returning uh, to Crimea uh, during the Soviet uh, regime. And now, uh, but uh, from another side, uh, we have um, occupation and in Crimea, and we have uh, uh, isolation uh, in framework framework of uh, uh, international community, and uh, so we have uh, very difficult uh, uh, choosing. Uh, but we try uh, to make balance because. Uh, uh, we uh, we try uh, to give uh, to young people from Crimea a chance uh, to choose uh, our life uh, uh, to make better. So, if you want to uh, go to studying uh, to Ukraine, you can uh, do it uh, through uh, state programs. You can do it. To, you can uh, uh, studying in Europe in uh, all world and uh, to uh, became a, a great uh, uh, education but if you want uh, to uh, to stay in crimea and you want uh, to live in crimea it's uh, we we also respect uh, this choose because it also it's too it's too hard but uh, we can understand that uh, uh, homeland and uh, feeling to homeland and uh, uh, to Crimea, it's uh, some. Uh, it's it's a very it's very important. And maybe uh, from another side, we understand uh, that uh, we need uh, Crimean youth in Crimea, uh, Ukrainian Ukrainians uh, Ukrainian citizens in Crimea because we uh, ma we should uh, uh, to show all Russians and Russia that it's our land is that it's uh, our homeland and uh, we uh, support Ukraine even we live in Crimea. Emil, the last time I was in Crimea was for a holiday. My tour guide showed me with endless pride how the Crimean Tatar place names were being restored in street signage and maps and place names otherwise. Since the Russian occupation, has the Russification included the removal of Crimean Tatar language signage uh, from the peninsula? And have there been other activities to help erase the identity of the Crimean Tatars' indigenous status on the Crimean Peninsula? I think now uh, Russians uh, trying uh, to Russify the Crimea because uh, uh, it's a political issue. So uh, we have many in Crimea. We have many uh, toponymical uh, 
places uh, which uh, remind us and uh, Ukraine in our, for all international communities that Crimea uh, have a, a very uh, uh, histo very historical Crimean Tatar background, um, very which very important for us. So from uh, Bakhchisarai Khan Palace to, uh, I don't know, uh, mask in uh, Yevpatoria or in Kislev. So, uh, but you know that uh, uh, after uh, deportation uh, of uh, Crimean Tatars uh, after 19, 1944, uh, all uh, places was uh, renamed by Soviet regime. Uh, and uh, now uh, we fighting for, um, Make uh, uh, to, to uh, make back uh, old uh, names uh, through Ukrainian uh, law, uh, and uh, we we uh, see uh, support from Ukrainian government in this issue. It's very important for us, and uh, in Crimean Tatar uh, community and Ukrainian community in Ukraine and Crimea also, we see that. Uh, we're trying uh, to support these names and uh, also we, we, when we speak with Russians, uh, we uh, can uh, say uh, uh, one name uh, of uh, such um, uh, some places and they don't can, can don't understand us. Uh, and uh, so it's for, for, for us, it's very uh, uh, principal, uh, uh, issue. It's an interesting observation. I know that here in Ireland, uh, under the British occupation for 700 years, they developed their own names for towns and cities. Uh, take, for example, Queenstown, uh, we would call it Cove, and Kingstown, we would call it Dunleary. Uh, so we have our own Irish names for our place names, and uh, that says a lot about our ability to endure an occupation. Um, before we go back to Zoria, though, let me ask you about conscription and mandatory military service in the Russian Federation. Are Crimean Tatars and Ukrainian nationals on Crimea being forcefully conscripted into the Russian military? I, I see uh, that is as a crime, and we have. I see that I know that it's. Uh, this crime uh, uh, started started not uh, uh, for for not for use but also for uh, child ch ch children because we have uh, like you know uh, um, children children uh, army and we know. Uh, Maybe Denise can uh, uh, say about it more. Uh, it's like uh, Jugend Hitler, but in Russia. So uh, it's a very difficult question for me. Uh, I want to go to Zoria now. Zoria, if I'm not much mistaken, it is the law that in the Russian Federation, young people must register for military service. Is the military conscription of Crimean Tatars and ethnic Ukrainians, seeing them forced into the Russian military service? Uh, yes, it's a big problem today because uh, we have militarization in all spheres of, um, of life in Crimea. And uh, this is a problem for young uh, men who live in Crimea because you need to uh, serve in Russian army um, usually not uh, in the territory of Crimean Peninsula uh, and uh, usually in the territory of uh, uh, Russian Federation uh, you serve for military services even uh, even uh, in places uh, which uh, um, not um, maintain to to bring peaceful means uh, and also we have another pro problem is youth militarization uh, militarization in education uh, as Emil uh, already spoke, we have uh, that the 
uh, culture of militarization uh, is indicating in uh, schools and preschools. And uh, today we have uh, uh, young uh, children, you know, as uh, five year olds, six year olds, um, playing uh, uh, in concentration camp prisoners or um, Mm, uh, or po uh, speaking poems aloud uh, of how good to be in Russian army and uh, for, for what uh, that all uh, is um, it's tried by uh, Russian Federation to erase all identities and to establish uh, one patriotic education for all uh, youth and uh, children in Crimea. And uh, today we have also uh, groups uh, in schools like um, uh, Russian Cossacks, uh, it's a military uh, group, or even some uh, groups um, aiming uh, to um, uh, to focus their attention on terroristic and extremistic uh, activities in uh, internet. And this all groups includes uh, children uh, from Crimean schools. Zoria, we've seen the videos of children as young as five through their teens, marching, drilling, wearing military uniforms, and even firing weapons on the occupied peninsula of Crimea. Your colleague, Emil, likened this to the Hitler Jugend, the Hitler Youth. Would you agree with that? Yes, I think um, it may be because uh, Russia takes its uh, taps uh, very slowly. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, uh, in 2015, Russia did not take any big uh, steps to uh, provide these uh, activities to militarize, uh, to militarize education. But a year after that, uh, the defense ministry issued uh, an order uh, to restore um, that youth army and uh, I think that was done to introduce uh, Russian identity, that now all Crimeans, uh, not Crimea Tatars, not Ukrainians, not uh, um, Krimchaks or other groups, they all Russians now. Zoria, I want to pick up on the conversation I had with Dennis about passportization. Russia wants to create what he described as the gray mass people who walk alike, talk alike, think alike, and adopt the Russian view of history, whether it's true or not. With the curtailing of religious freedom on Crimea for the Crimean Tatars, the prohibition against the use of the Crimean Tatar language, the forced use of Russian in schools, and the curtailing of democratic rights, can you continue to identify as a Crimean Tatar under this Russian occupation and essentially is there a future for young Crimean Tatars as Crimean Tatars under this Russian regime? Uh, we believe in that future. And uh, when we are talking about education in today's uh, Crimea, uh, we always talk about the situation with Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar language in schools. Uh, today, uh, we are um, uh, we have a total removal of the Ukrainian language uh, in Crimean Tatar schools. Uh, formerly, we have Crimean Tatar language classes, but in fact, uh, they uh, don't um, function in that way as uh, it must be. And uh, Russia is spending a vast amount of money and uh, uh, efforts uh, on indoctrinating, indoctrinating children. Uh, in occupied Crimea to believe that they are Russians, that they want to be Russians, and uh, the Russian in, is only nationality that um, may be in uh, Crimea. Uh, so uh, what we should to do, uh, we try to establish, to maintain and straighten communication with that people uh, who was born and grew up in uh, Crimea after uh, annexation um, by the Russian Federation. And uh, we try to give them opportunity to uh, enter Ukrainian universities, uh, to maintain their uh, identity like Ukrainians and like Crimean Tatars. Zoria, I wouldn't insult you by trying to tell you your own history. But we both know that the Crimean Tatars have suffered at Russian hands over the last two centuries. 
1944, your grandparents' generation were rounded up in the middle of the night and transported to the Russian interior where many died in what is widely acknowledged as a genocide. When Ukraine regained her independence 30 years ago, the Crimean Tatars were able to return to the peninsula and since then your community has thrived. Your parents have built a future on Crimea, which the Russians have now taken away. Does your generation have the strength and perseverance and determination to survive this Russian occupation and rebuild the Crimean Tatar community on Crimea, where your people have lived for well over a millennia? As you, you know, uh, we already faced this problem uh, again, and uh, I believe that we have a wonderful experience how to maintain our identity throughout uh, decades. Uh, today we have uh, Ukraine and all of the international um, communication, uh, international community on the, our side. Uh, so I believe that it's not a big problem to maintain uh, your uh, culture and your identity if you want uh, to deal with it. Zoria, I want to go back to 1994 when the United States, Great Britain, and Russia signed the Budapest Memorandum, which guaranteed Ukraine's territorial sovereignty and integrity. And that included Crimea as part of Ukraine. Russia betrayed you. They invaded, occupied, and attempted to annex Crimea. If you could speak to the American leaders, to the British, and to the Russians, as well as the rest of the world today, what would you ask of them? And what would you say to them? Um, diplomacy today is a better way to reintegrate Crimea, to, get, uh, to take it back. And uh, I have one thing that uh, I want to tell the international community. Uh, please continue support Ukraine and continue support uh, Crimean status because a diplomacy and cultural diplomacy is the only way uh, to reintegrate Crimean Peninsula and the lawful uh, system of uh, Ukraine government and uh, to bring uh, all things uh, back in the way that should be. And Zoria, I have a special request of you. Would you speak in your mother tongue, the Crimean Tatar language? and send a message to those who languish and suffer under the Russian occupation on the Crimean Peninsula, those who might be jailed and are looking for hope. What words might you share with them? First of all, I uh, would like to express my gratitude to you uh, for keeping Ukraine and Crimea high in today's agenda. And uh, what I want to tell my uh, brothers and sisters in Crimea. Assalamu alaikum wa tandashwaram. Bugun sis vi bis khram tatarmas bur zor dunya da yashyamas. Ama bizim milletmas eki bolunda bolushta. Ama epumas aine olajamas khram da bizim ki olajja. I want to thank you all for your time. It's not easy to get a Zoom call coordinated with people living everywhere from Eastern Europe in Ukraine to New York. The time zones aren't friends to any of us, but we've managed to do it. Before we go, I want to whip around the room and see if anybody had any last thoughts. Let's go to you, Isla. Yes, I wanted to share with you a, um, a uh, an upcoming um, uh, lead up to the International De Decade of uh, Indigenous Languages in 2022. Actually, the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, uh, which is going to start in 2022, right in a month, um, actually, it was the idea uh, that was uh, presented by the country of Bangladesh. And it got approved way back in 1999 by UNESCO. And it was submitted, uh, presented at the uh, general con uh, conference. This is uh, 
uh, really a wonderful um, opportunity for indigenous people and everyone alike whose um, countries are occupied to really showcase in concrete form uh, that there is an actual occupation, that there's an actually, actually assimilation policy that's ensuing, as was mentioned by Zora and Emil and Dennis on the educational uh, programs uh, as uh, the uh, mechanism modality uh, that they use. And um, so this platform will really, really assist us into um, giving us an expression of what's happening on the ground. And I just wanted to share uh, with you, Michael, and your audience that the two youth that we have present here, Emil and Zore, uh, translate and also um, interpret um, all languages uh, that they know into the Crimean Tatar language. So they excel, uh, uh, they just don't talk about it, but they have studied it and they speak it and they write it and they translate it. So uh, it is a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. And the loss of languages is so, so important for us as indigenous people in an occupied territory because um, it, it's also a way of annihilation that we are eventually will become annihilated if we do not, preserve our language. And the Crimean Tatar uh, Resource Center in Kiev took this initiative very seriously and they translated the uh, United Nation Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the Crimean Tatar language. And I believe it's uh, translated into 520 languages and now uh, Crimean Tatar was just added on. Uh, uh, as the 521st. And this says a lot, given that there are 370 million indigenous peoples worldwide. They live in 70, uh, 70 countries, and yet only 6% of them speak their own language. So it is something that United Nations has recognized, and it is embraced by um, huge amount of people. So we will uh, showcase it um, at the upcoming UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And from our impressive young legal scholar at Crimea SOS, Denis Sevchenko, anything from you? Yes, I just wanted to thank you for uh, bringing a light to the topic of Crimea, to the situation in Crimea. Um, for many people abroad, especially uh, divided uh, by the ocean, this problem uh, may appear very distant and uh, not important. But uh, what we see working with the, the occupation of Crimea for uh, seven years already is that uh, in its essence, Russian Federation does not only violate the territorial integrity of Ukraine, it violates the fundamental rules of co-living that we all agreed upon, um, I think, after the end of the Second uh, World War, when the UN started functioning actively and when the treaties and conventions and all the other documents were adopted. And I think it is very important to remind the uh, wide publicity about what is happening, what Russian Federation is doing, uh, not only in Ukraine, but also in uh, Georgia, Nagorny Karabakh, uh, um, uh, the part of, of Moldova, Pridnistrovia, we call, we call it, uh, that you have already mentioned, in Syria and in many other countries. Uh, I think that uh, why we try to remind uh, white publicity, including the foreign partners about Crimea is that uh, because this is a very bright example of how uh, one country, one actor uh, violating rules can bring so much damage and can provide such a negative example for other uh, countries uh, to just ignore and violate international standards and treaties and in this case uh, all the uh, all the people living all around the globe can become victims i hope they will not uh, 
I definitely would like the occupation of Crimea to stop immediately the active uh, uh, fighting in Donbass to stop actively and all the other conflicts around the world to uh, stop immediately. But we have to remember that uh, all the evil, it has a tendency to spread and talking about it, fighting it, um, raising awareness of, uh, about it could be a very powerful uh, weapon. And this is what we've been trying to do uh, during this session, and I am very grateful to you and all the other people involved in this process. Uh, I have, hope it will help at least a little. Dennis, sadly, I have to agree with you. I share your concern about the normalization of aggression throughout the world. I, I remember uh, with Transnistria and Moldova, uh, everyone said it's a small area, and the Russians do have a right to occupy it. And then it was Georgia, then Donbass and Crimea, uh, then it's Syria. Um, all throughout the world, strong men are reemerging in Africa. Uh, dictators seem to be emerging everywhere. We have conflicts like the military junta in Myanmar, which uh, brutalized the Burmese people. There seems to be no end of it. So it's something I'm sure we'll talk about again. I want to thank you for your time. And now, Emil, do you have any last thoughts? Yeah, I can say uh, thank you for this opportunity to explain our positions and uh, thank you to Ireland uh, uh, for supporting uh, Crimea uh, on uh, diplomatic uh, space. Uh, now, uh, we have uh, big problems um, in uh, Crimea, as uh, you know, uh, with the young people. But we're trying to uh, save uh, communication and uh, connect with uh, with youth in Crimea. Also, um, as um, before, uh, Ayla Hanum, Ayla Bakalu said about Nariman Jalal, uh, leader of Majlis Crimean Tatar. Uh, also, uh, with with which in 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 this day, uh, which uh, with. Uh, uh, Nariman Jilal was imprisoned, uh, also our friend Aziz Akhtemov and Asan Akhtemov, uh, two brothers. And I uh, can uh, say that Aziz Akhtemov was our friend and was uh, volunteering, uh, volunteering in QHAB before uh, he returned uh, to Crimea. And uh, he, he was he, he participated in uh, our organization in uh, youth uh, community in Ukraine and Kiev and helped us. And but now uh, we, we we can uh, we uh, just can uh, help him uh, with 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 letters with uh, some uh, I don't know subjects on money maybe. Uh, it was it it it, uh, it we, which we can do, uh, but for us uh, supporting uh, on international level, and uh, Aziz Akhtemov and uh, uh, Aziz uh, brother uh, Asan Akhtemov, it's very very important, and uh, we just uh, trying to remind for our uh, uh, audience about uh, Aziz Akhtemov and uh, because he have. Uh, uh, family also he have he have a wife and uh, a little child so for us it's very important to, so thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity uh, i want to go to zori now thank you so much for keeping no. this um topic high and uh, I urge uh, all the international governments, uh, all the international community to continue support Ukraine and uh, Crimean Tatar people in this uh, fight for freedom. Thank you so much. On behalf of Diplomacy in Ireland, the European diplomat, I'm Michal O'Hurley, your host. You've been watching In Conversation this week. We've had as our special guest, Ms. Ayla Bacali, the Crimean Tatar representative at the United Nations. We've had Mr. Denis Sivchenko of Crimea SOS and from QHUB, an organization to support the Crimean Tatars during the Russian occupation of their native homeland. We've had Emil Ibrahim 
and Zoria Mustafayeva. Thank you for having joined us. We have appreciated our guest. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Stay safe, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. And now it's time for a brief editorial statement. As a journalist, I'm not supposed to become involved in stories. My personal opinion shouldn't matter. But as a human being, I feel compelled to speak out where I find evil, indignity, and injustice. Diplomacy in Ireland, the European diplomat, was founded to celebrate those principles held by us in Ireland, in the European Union, and at the United Nations. And that is upholding the rule of law, promoting human dignity, preserving human rights, and prosperity and peace. I think back to the 1930s when there were journalists who stayed silent about the coming storm that they knew was happening. And I think about those brave journalists who told the truth while the world marched towards misery. And therefore I must call on Russia to release all political prisoners. Indeed, I call on regimes everywhere to release all political prisoners, be they in Belarus or Burma or the United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, China, or anywhere else in the world. Imprisoning people because of their political activities is not part of democracy freedom, or the dignified human march towards a better world. We call on occupying powers everywhere to leave those lands which they unlawfully occupy and promote the restoration of sovereignty and the territorial integrity of those lands which they occupied. In short, we're calling for people to observe the basic premises of humanity, that is, respect for one another, cooperation, and upholding a rules-based world order. That's what was subscribed to at the United Nations upon its founding, and that's the goal to which we should all aspire. Thank you.